We're in the book of Hebrews this morning. I don't know if it's interesting to you how these messages come about. It is interesting to me because I'm directly involved in them. I do not recommend that any pastor would follow my own personal uh, way of these things. I don't know what's right and wrong. I know what the Lord has called me to do. Um, I don't, I study all through the week, not to preach, but I study for myself. I study to have the Lord work in my own heart. And when he works in my heart, I write it down in a notebook. And so I have probably 10 or 12 notebooks full of things that the Lord has worked in my heart. Um, some of them have, many of them have turned into messages over the years. Um, some of them are still not, so I assume those were just for me. But throughout the week, typically the Lord will give you the idea, and so you kind of chew on it throughout the week. And then on, Sunday, on Saturday night, I sit down and I will flesh out the entire outline. I sleep on it on, in the evening on Saturday night, get up early and write the whole thing out word for word. That's typical. Do you realize you can't study if you don't know what the message is? So, you, if the Lord doesn't give you anything, you read and 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 you read till you can't read anymore. And that's what I did last night. Do you know what it's like to go to bed knowing you have to speak the next day <laughs> without having anything to say and don't even have any clue where you're going and there's nothing you can do about it except go to bed early when your mind can't work anymore, you just go to bed, you set your alarm, get up 45 minutes earlier than you typically do. I forgot to set my alarm. I set it for 45 minutes earlier, but I forgot to set it, turn it on. And the Lord woke me up uh, with three minutes to spare. Um, and so I got up and I started. And so typically I've had a chance to sleep on this. I've had a chance to consider it all through the week. And this morning, it's not that at all. So it will not be polished if they're ever polished, but it doesn't bother me that I have not had a ton of time. It doesn't, I've learned to trust the Lord, that he will bring the message when he's ready. I've learned to trust him on that, but at the top of almost every message that I have preached and every Sunday school lesson that I've taught in the last six months, they have the same words written at the top. I write them every time I sit down to write something, and it says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Yes. It also says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That's why I'm standing up here this morning. Not because I have anything to say, but I believe that God has something to say. I believe his spirit has something to say. And if his spirit's not saying it, there's no sense in us sitting here. But I personally believe that the Lord uses his word, and I trust him to do it this morning, despite my deficiencies. And so we're in Hebrews chapter number 13. This may be a little more technical than what I typically am, and I may be stuck to my notes a little more. Hebrews chapter number 13, verse number 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is good that it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not, been pro which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by high, the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go, therefore, let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. The world of people can basically be divided into two groups of people. You have math types and you have art types. How many of you would consider yourself a math type? How many of you consider yourself an art type? 
We divide ourselves. Now, everybody, I think everybody, actually has a little of both in them. But one of them will be dominant over the other. For the last couple of years, I've been trying to develop my art skills. I still can't draw a stick man. But I have been trying to develop those skills. But the reality is, math is my dominant side. When I was in the 10th grade, we took geometry class. Lots of kids hated geometry. How many of you hated geometry? I absolutely loved geometry. The, it is all pure logic. And they would give you these problems. They would give you a diagram. And then you had to logically prove, if this is true, then this is true, then this is true, then this is true. You had to come up with the answer, but you had to prove why it was true. I absolutely loved that. For instance, if you, got, if you don't remember geometry, you have two parallel lines, and you have a diagonal line coming down through it. If you know that angle there, subtract 100, it from 180, and you know that angle there, which means you know that angle there and that angle there, but you also know all four of these angles as well. I absolutely loved the proving, these theorems that you work through. It was just my logical side coming out. In this passage this morning, it's very much like that geography, not geometry, not geography, geometry. It is much like that. Each verse is taking that next logical step from the previous verse. It's fascinating if you can pay attention to it, if you can follow along with it. We'll call it this morning Paul's logic. Paul's logic. Let's pray. Father, we need you desperately. Without you, this is an absolute, complete waste of time. But it is not within our heart to waste time, and it is not within yours to ever waste time. You have given us a copy of your word, and you have given us the Holy Spirit, and we have come for the Spirit to teach us. So push out any of the false thoughts, draw us into your presence, and teach us that we might think aright and live aright. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The book of Hebrews is not actually signed. But through the style of the writings and the information that is contained, it is generally acknowledged that Paul is the writer here. In verse number 8, we have a direct statement laid out. Look at verse number 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. That is a very plain statement. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we leave this in the geometrical world, if we had a piece of graph paper, a timeline, if you would, think about how this would be drawn. This would be drawn with a straight line with arrows on both ends, would it not? If you remember that far back. It is a line that continues both ways in, without stopping. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He would be represented that way. He is continual in both directions. Compare that to your own. How would you draw in that graph paper? How would you draw your life? It would have a dot, which means it has a beginning point, nine months before you were born. And it would continue on in that direction with an arrow, except for the fact that you would have another dot that would be a line segment, an end date, so you'd have a beginning date and an end date, but you don't actually end there. You would probably use either a different color or a shaded line to produce, to say, continuing in a different plane. Does that make sense what I'm saying? That would be yours. Christ would be an arrow going both directions without stopping. Yours would be a starting point with a stopping point, with a continuation in a different plane. Now, here we have Paul's explanation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. His line stretching out without any variation. 
Now, try to visualize this on a piece of graph paper. And then add to that Adam and Eve. Add to that Moses, Abraham, the apostles, Christopher Columbus, and you. Each one of those things, think about the differences of life, the differences of civilization in each of those, from Adam and Eve to the apostles to Christopher Columbus to today. You would say civilization is not the same at all. Our manner of living is not the same at all. Everything has changed from then to now. All of those changes, at the same time, Jesus Christ has remained unchanged, totally, completely unchanged through all of those segments of life. Everybody understand that? You have an unchanging person in the person of Jesus Christ. Everything else has changed drastically, but the one constant has been Jesus Christ. No matter which segment of history you look at, Christ was there and was exactly the same. That's Paul's foundation. Verse number 9. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Okay, now you've got to put this into context here. Who's this book written to? Is anybody alive today? Okay. <laughs> Who's this book written to? Hebrews. Hebrews. Okay, the Jewish people. Now, I don't <clears throat> know how much you live in your national heritage. I'm Dutch. You've never seen me in a pair of wooden shoes, nor will you ever see me in a pair of wooden shoes. I don't do those kinds of things. I don't celebrate my national heritage. Many people, some people do, some people don't. What did the Jewish people think about their national heritage? They were totally consumed with their national heritage. Everything that they thought came from Abraham and Moses and the Old Testament law. They were consumed with it. Now this is going to require some focused thinking on your part. The laws of the Old Testament were meant to point us to Christ. The laws of the Old Testament were meant to point us to Christ. Is Christ different in the Old Testament or not? No, he is an unchanging throughout all time. That's the foundation we set. And the Old Testament laws were to point us to this unchangeable one. The laws of the Old Testament were meant to point us to Christ. The various laws of meats and sacrifices in the Old Testament were meant to point men to the unchanging Christ. The Jews actually didn't see it. They missed this part. They got focused on these laws. These laws became a line, if you will, uh, uh, that they were following, a separate line, if you will, that they were following. They made them diverse and strange doctrines. They took the Old Testament laws and separated them in their thinking from Christ. They had this, do they had this line that was running that did not lead them to Christ. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? They were following, they had made these lines, these laws of the Old Testament, a separate line. Where did they lead if they didn't lead to Christ? And the answer to that is nowhere. That's where they led them, nowhere. They had been going in circles all of that time. They were going nowhere. Look at what it says in the passage here. For it's, a good thing, for it's a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. These lines, when they separated them from Christ, got them nowhere. There was no benefit to the followers. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, full of grace and truth. So the grace mentioned here is Christ, and these laws that they were following, uh, separated from Christ, is led them nowhere. 
So now let's, let's read it together. Get this all in your thinking. Put that line of Christ running nonstop through history, unwavering. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meat. That you would focus on Christ, not on these Old Testament laws, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Those who were consumed with these laws apart from Christ didn't profit. So get the picture here. Jesus Christ runs unchanged through history. In the time of Moses, the law was given to point men to Christ. Instead, the Jews focused on the law and didn't reap the benefit of these laws, even though they had completely occupied their time in trying to obey them. Now look at verse number 10. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. You know, Paul here is reminding them of the laws that has been occupying all of their time. Okay, now I'm not an expert on Old Testament law, but let's get us in the ballpark. There were all kinds of offerings and sacrifices in the Old Testament. If you have ever read completely through the Bible, uh, in a, like in a Bible through a year thing, when you get into the later part of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you get sandbagged there. You get bogged down. Why? Because there are these laws after laws after sacrifice after sacrifice, offering after offering. It gets very tedious. There were wave offerings. There was heave offerings. There was sacrifice for sins. Some of them were bread, and some were the grain. Some were incense. Some were blood. Some were meat. These offerings were offered in the tabernacle, that portable tent building that was eventually replaced by the temple. They were doing all of these offerings, all of these sacrifices. Some of these offerings only the priests could eat from. Remember when David is running from Saul. He stops at the tabernacle, and what does the, the priest give him? The show bread. He says, boy, this is not common bread here. And so then they kind of fudge it over like, okay, it's, it's kind of in a way common, and the men have not, okay, we'll take it. That bread was meant specifically for the priests. In the book of 2 Samuel, now let me make sure of that, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter number 2, when Eli is having trouble with his sons, it explains actually the process where the, the, the priest could get meat. They had a pot boiling with this meat in it that had been offered. What did they get to do? Actually, it's three, but yes, you're right. They had a three-pronged flesh hook is what they called it. They could stick it down in there and pull it out. And whatever they got is what they got to eat. They also, it insinuates that they could take some of the meat after it had been cooked, as long as the fat and the other parts had been cooked away, then they could eat some of that. But they could only eat some of these offerings. Others of it was not available. Look at verse number 10. For we have an altar wherein they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. Christ is an unchanging line running through all of history. The Old Testament laws point to him, but some followed the laws apart from him with no profit. Paul reminds them of the law and that some of the meat the priests could not, that they could eat and some they could not eat. Which brings us to verse number 11. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. There were lots of sacrifices and lots of offerings. Mary, we just came through Christmas. Mary and Joseph offered what? Turtle doves. They could have offered a bullock or, or a goat. They could have offered something else, but they offered a turtle dove. That's what they could afford. What was that offering for? This was a newborn baby. They are offering this as a as a thanksgiving, really, what you'd call the opening of the womb, this new baby. There were other offerings, like thanksgiving offerings and our offerings at the harvest time. 
there were also sin offerings. On some of those other offerings, the priest could eat. But when it came to the sin offering, they could not eat of that offering. They would bring the animal. The priest would lay his hands on it as a transference of sin. They would kill this animal. They would shed its blood. They would sprinkle the blood on the altar. They would burn some of the fat and some of the other parts on the altar. Then they would take the rest of the animal, all of the meat, the bones, the skin, and they would take it outside of the camp and burn it outside. They did not burn it and offer it in the tabernacle. They carried it outside. The priest was not allowed to eat of any of that when it was a sin, an offering for sin. It was a sin offering. It was taken outside of the camp and burned. It was significant that the animal was not burned inside the tabernacle, inside the, where they normally sacrificed. Things that were taken outside of the camp are despised, they're unwanted, they are rejected. See if you can get your mind to wrap around this. We do the same thing. Okay, so here we go. If you were new to Des Moines today, you just moved into the area, you've got a house now, and you have got a whole car load of trash. Where will you look for the junkyard? Where will you look for the dump? Would you drive downtown to, to the principal building? You say, well, maybe. <laughs> you wouldn't go downtown. Would you go over to Jordan Creek to the mall and drive around the mall, see if you could find the, a, the, the landfill? Where would you go? You would look outside of the town because they don't put the dump in the middle of town. If you were going to put in a plant that had a lot of smell to it, if you were going to build the rendering plant, where would you try to locate that? In some private neighborhood? Over by, the, by Jordan Creek Mall there, downtown, You'd say, uh, no, we have zoning laws. Where do we put that stuff? Outside of town, away from the people. Why? Because it's despised. It's not something we want. It's refuse. So we do understand this. The outside of town. Outside the city limits. We do understand this. This is what they did with the sin offering. They killed it. They poured the blood on the mercy seat. They offered some of the parts, the fat and so forth, on there. And they took all the rest of it outside the camp and burned it out there as so much refuse. Paul is trying to get us thinking here. He's progressing logically. If this is true, then this is true, then this is true, then this is true. Now he puts it together. Look at verse number 12. Sorry, my Bible turned its own pages here. Look at verse number 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. The Old Testament laws pointed to Christ. Try to get your mind to comprehend this. Christ is this nonstop, ever unchanging line running through history without end on either side. The Old Testament laws are given to point men to Christ. They get sidetracked and they just start thinking about the, the, the laws in and of themselves and they lose the fact that it's connected to Christ. But all the time, these laws are pointing to Christ. And they have these different offerings and sacrifices. And now they come and they have one 
the offering for sin. From the very beginning, when Adam sinned in the garden, what did what happened to cover their sin? Get your mind to think on that. What did God do at that moment for a covering for sin? He killed an animal and made clothes as a, part, as a picture of covering for sin. All through the Old Testament, we have these pictures of Christ. All through the Old Testament, this sacrificial lamb is being shown. Until we get to John the Baptist who says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. All of this... All of these sacrifices have been pointing to Christ. If you get off of that, you end up with nowhere. It's these strange doctrines that lead you to no place. It's a waste of time. But in this process, what they were pointing to was the person of Jesus Christ. Now get the picture in your mind. They had, the priest would take his hands and put them on that lamb. It's an offering for sin. In essence, they're transferring that sin, the sins of the people, to this lamb. They would sacrifice the lamb, they would apply the blood, and they would take it out and burn it as so much refuse. Jesus Christ. He did not symbolically or ceremonially take your sin, but actuality. He truly took your sin. Your sin was placed on him. Not in a picture, but in reality. And the reality of that is the wages of sin is death. He must die. That is the punishment. And so he is crucified. But where is he crucified? He's dying for the sins of the whole world. Do they put him in the public center and praise him? Yay, he's dying for our sin. What a wonderful Savior. Do they hold a big party and, and rejoice in this work of God for mankind? Do they stand up and give testimonies about how wonderful he is? They take him to a place called Golgotha. A place where the condemned went. A place where the worst of the worst. The people who are no longer fit to live on this planet go there. A place of torture and suffering. He takes them outside the camp as so much refuse. And he suffers without the camp. His blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat and our salvation is complete. This whole time it's been a picture of Jesus Christ the Jews got way off in their thinking. They started focusing on these laws, not as connected with Christ, but as just laws in and of themselves. And it ended up nowhere. But Christ has run nonstop through history, unchanged. The laws pointed to Christ. And he suffered outside the camp as so much refuse. in this lowly place outside the camp called Golgotha. It is a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter number 53. He is despised and rejected of men. He was crucified in a place of ridicule and scorn, a place of condemnation, a place of rejection and torture. He suffered outside the camp. Jesus Christ is unchanged through history. The laws of the Old Testament were pointing to him. It was a mistake to separate those laws apart from Christ. Some of the sacrifices that were edible for the priest, but the offering for sin was not. It was burned outside the camp as despised. And Christ, the true offering for sin, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, was taken outside of the camp to Golgotha. He suffered the rejection, the humiliation, the torture of the cross for our sin. My friend, this is a wondrous picture. It is the best news a human being can actually hear. The fact that our sins were paid for. This ceremonial lamb, the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. But the lamb of God, our sin is placed on him. 
And he willingly went outside the camp to suffer for our sins. This unchanging Christ has suffered without the camp for our sins. He died in our place. He paid our debt in full and rose again from the dead. He is the one, the only Savior of the world. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is wondrous news. Many in this room are rejoicing in it right now. Many in this room have put their faith in Jesus Christ in the finished work of the cross and our sins have been dealt with there. We sing with a glad heart, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you're here today and you have not trusted Christ as your Savior, we would encourage you to put your trust in Him. We would beg of you to see Christ high and lifted up. Don't get lost in some religious ceremony, some offering that has nothing to do with Christ. They pointed to Christ. He's the unchanging one through all of history. And we would ask, we would beg of you today to put your trust in Him. But the fact of the matter is, Paul doesn't stop at verse number 12. He is the unchanging line through history. And the Old Testament was pointing to him. It was a mistake to not see that. The offering for sin was taken outside the camp as despised. Jesus Christ was that offering for sin. Get your mind to wrap around this here this morning. He's that offering for sin. He was not taken to the center of town on parade. He was not placed in a position of honor by humanity. He was not praised and worshipped by the world. He was taken outside of the camp like so much garbage, so much refuse. And what Paul is saying is, if that was true, and this is true, then this is true, then this is true, then this must be true. What must be true? Look at verse 13. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. This is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, for the believer. If Christ is without the camp, where should we be? If Christ was despised by the world, what should they think of us? If the world hates our Savior, why do we seek their approval? If he was unfit to live among them, how can we be otherwise? If Christ had to suffer without the camp, what is this easygoing, acceptable to the world life around us that we live? How can this be? If Christ is despised by the world, how can we be loved? How can Christ have had to suffer and we aren't even inconvenienced? How can Christ be rejected and we not even cause a second glance. He's unchanging through line through history. If he was despised by the world then, then he is still despised by them today. How can we be escaping the same treatment if we truly are linked with him? Can you get your mind to figure that? If Christ is despised and put outside the camp as where he belongs, how is it possible that we can live inside without any repercussion? How can we be linked with Christ and not even be inconvenienced? There's got to be something wrong here. He suffered without the camp. And we as his followers should be right there with him. 
If this is true, then this is true, then this is true, then this is true. And this is true. Christ suffered outside the camp. And we should be right there with him. Look at verse number 14. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. This verse is actually a two-edged weapon, both positively and negatively, but it's only stated in the positive. In the positive, it assumes that the previous theorem is true of us. It's, it's believing, it's accepting the fact that, oh, you guys are suffering outside the camp. Oh, you are part of this. Oh, yes, you are being despised. You are actually suffering for the cause of Christ. It's assuming that in this positive form here. It's assuming that the previous statement was true. And it's therefore gives us a word of encouragement. It says, we have no continuing city here. In other words, we don't live here. This isn't our permanent address. We're just passing through. Have you ever noticed how much you'll suffer, how much you'll put up with when you're traveling? It is astounding what we will put up with while we're traveling. How many people like someone else in your personal space? I don't like people in my personal space. <laughs> Not mine. No. <laughs> I don't like people in my personal space. When you sit on an airplane, what do you do? <laughs> I sit like this. We always get the cheap seats, which are right in the middle of everybody. You know, Carol's sitting up there and some others. She's up in first class. But no. <laughs> no. <laughs> she always buys the tickets. I'm sitting there. We always get the cheap tickets, which means that you, they don't assign your seat. And they, so they give you the worst seat in the plane, which is right in the middle, toward the back. So I'm sitting here, and there's somebody on this side, and there's somebody on this side. And for two and a half hours, I sit like this. How many know what I'm talking about? Because the, the people next to you, you know, they're all laid out, and you're trying to uh, just stay out of my space here, pal, okay? I hate people in my personal space. But you know what? You get on a plane, it's what you do. Why? It's only for two hours. I can put up with anything. I've got to get where I'm going. I'll put up. When we travel to the kids, a lot of times we drive. And so Macy will take the wheel. She'll be driving. And I'll climb in the back. Since there are only three of us, Carol's in the, other, in the passenger's front seat. So I'm in the back. Have you ever tried to sleep in the back of a mini of a SUV-type vehicle? You lay down fine, but your legs have to wrap in a pretzel. And you're trying to sleep back. They're wrapped in this pretzel. Why do you do that? It's only temporary. We're trying to get from point A to point B. It's all right. This is not the way I'm living. It's just the way I have to travel. And this is, the par, this is what Paul is saying. You don't live here. You don't live here. Okay, so you're being inconvenient. So they make you stand outside of the camp. So they treat you like so much refuse. So you don't have a continuing city here. This isn't your permanent address. You're going someplace else where there is a city to come. So it's a little inconvenient now to be linked with Christ. It is no big deal. You're just passing through. You have a goal in mind, a place that you want to be, and you're headed there. For we here, verse 14, have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Now, this is actually not a new concept in this letter to the Hebrews. If you look back one page to Hebrews 11, verse number 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they, say, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they had come out, they might have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. 
Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. Drop down to verse number 24. For by faith Moses, when he came to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had a respect unto the recompense of reward. Verse number 40, God having proved some better things for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. This is no new theme with Paul. He's been preaching this the whole way through. You are a pilgrim here. You are just passing through. It is no big deal if they treat you terribly. Christ suffered without the camp and so should you. If you're going to be a follower of him, you're going to be outside the camp and you shouldn't sweat that. Because this isn't your home. You have a city coming that's important. And you're moving through to that spot. But the sword does cut the other way. It cuts in the negative. If we are not bearing his reproach, if there is no suffering or even inconvenience for his sake, what does that mean? It means that we have settled into this life like it's our own permanent residence. And we have forgotten the city to come. I wonder how many of God's people are flat out lying when they sing, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. Now, technically, it's true, for sure. We're all headed to heaven. But how many of God's people sing that, and it is a flat-out lie? This world has become their home. This world has become their focus. Too often, we act like this life is a continuing city, and we settle down in it, and we forget the permanent place that we actually have in the heavens. Paul lays it out very carefully, step by step. Jesus Christ is the same, continually unchanging. The Old Testament all pointed to him. Although the Jews misused that and they wasted their time because they separated those laws from him, some of their laws were edible, but the, not the sin offering. It was burned outside of the camp as rejected. And Christ, who was offered for sin, suffered outside of the camp. And we, as followers of Christ, should have that same effect on the world. They should despise us as we are conformed to his image. Step by step, he walks us through it, and then he says, it's okay. This isn't our home. Our home is elsewhere. If there is no shame or suffering for his name, it may very well mean that we are not what we ought to be. Just for further thought, the picture that's actually been drawn here on the outside realm of this is as one of the priests using a flesh hook to take meat from the offering of sin. I'll leave you to think through that, but that's actually the picture that's being drawn here. It's not an edible offering. They weren't supposed to enjoy that. It's a, the, the picture here is if you are seeking this world, you're like one of the priests putting in that flesh hook into the offering of sin so that you can eat that meat instead of it being burned outside the camp. Does this passage describe your life? Can you argue with Paul's logic? Let's pray.